we should start with introductions. Hey, I'm Simeon. Uh, since people said, you know, LinkedIn folks, I hook up on LinkedIn, uh, follow me on Twitter. My handle down, is down there. I've been a technical instructor uh, with Twitter University for five years or so. I'm program manager for Twitter University, uh, which is what we call our engineering training program. And I've been at Twitter for just nine months. I joined in January. And feel free to follow me on Twitter. I only sometimes talk about work. Otherwise, it's just kind of a weird place. But happy to have you if you want to follow me. All right, so peer learning. Uh, it's been touched on a couple of times today. I heard the phrase network intelligence used. This is a lot of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, basically, at Twitter, we focus on leveraging the knowledge that we have in and have engineers teach other engineers. So rather than bringing in people externally and saying, OK, we're going to bring someone in to teach us Java or teach us Python, uh, we use people on the teams. And that is great because they can teach how do we specifically use this thing at Twitter and really tailor specifically to what we're doing. And um, as well, we, we focus on, um, we use this volunteer program. So we only have a couple of full-time instructors. And everyone else, it's not their full-time job to teach. They um, have another, they have their regular day job, and then they're just teaching part of the time. So then uh, the other part of our talk title, and I'm, I'm feeling good we didn't call this like solving peer learning at scale or something. Um, but the, uh, scale is kind of the challenge area. And, uh, you know, I mean a lot of things by scale. Um, one, Twitter has a large engineering workforce. And uh, we've never had very many technical instructors. I think the kind of biggest ratio we've had is still in the ballpark of one instructor to a thousand engineers or so. Um, and then Twitter has a, a large custom software infrastructure. So internally, there's lots of stuff that's just at Twitter. And uh, that limits the availability of that commodity training. You can't expect that people will come and understand a lot of the technologies they might use Twitter. Amplifies that need for, for peer learning. Sometimes, like, literally the only person who can explain this thing, you know, is going to be your peer, somebody on your team. And then, of course, as far as scale goes, we've got distributed offices and lots of time zones of countries and languages, things like that. So uh, just kind of briefly, the team, um, Twitter University was founded when Twitter acquired Maracana back in 2013. Uh, I worked there with, with Marco. You've been, you've been seeing up here, uh, I don't think we've had more than six headcount, and we're mostly technical instructors, so people who kind of teach classes and facilitate engineers teaching classes and program management. We also work closely with our sister team, TechDocs, who's in charge of technical documentation at Twitter. And I would say we kind of have two main programs. So one program uh, is the onboarding. It's a week-long in-person onboarding for new hires who are joining the engineering organization specifically, and then some follow-up courses um, that are more specific to different roles, maybe different orgs. And uh, Katie's going to tell you a little bit more about that particular program. The other program, it's not just one program. It's all the other programs uh, that we run. So many programs, some of which we're going to tell you about here in a moment. Um, but just to kind of one data point to measure our success at pushing for peer learning. Last uh, year, a little better than 10% of Twitter engineers taught a course through Twitter University. Great. So rather than just talk at you about some principles, uh, we're going to illustrate the things that we want to share via stories. So we prepared five case studies uh, touching on different areas of our program. and. Uh, Along the way, we'll be pulling out different pieces of advice, lessons learned, both good and bad, successes and failures that we had. So we're looking forward to uh, sharing with you the things that we've learned from what we do, the hard way or the easy way. So the first case study, uh, the first story I want to tell you about is actually, um, well, us telling you stories is us taking our own advice. And that's one of the first pieces of advice we have for engineers is, hey, you know, sh share your stories with each other. Um, and this could be the starting point for, for peer learning. Um, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. We have a variety of courses that sort of fall under this rubric. So uh, Jen mentioned War Stories, and we actually have a, a course on our LMS called War Stories, and you already know what that's about. If you want a War story series in your technical uh, organization, just find a senior engineer and ask them, hey, what's the biggest disaster you've ever been a part of? Right? And then put your feet up for 20 minutes and ask if they want to tell uh, that story to a wider audience. Um, we have a variety of other courses that are also kind of directed at getting people um, to share their stories with each other. So we have reading groups. There's a security reading group started by the security team, a variety of machine learning reading groups uh, started by various machine learning teams. Um, there's a distributed systems reading group. And the cool thing about the reading group format is it doesn't rely upon an expert. So all you need is an enthusiastic facilitator. And the typical format is everyone who's interested agrees ahead of time about a paper, maybe a blog post. It doesn't have to be academic. 
and then you get together over lunch and you talk about it. But one other uh, format that we've uh, we've encouraged the the reading groups have really taken off for us in the last uh, last year or two, especially. Um, th those are basically you could think about it as an ongoing single focus meetup group, and we also have tech talks, which tend to be more random topic meetup groups. So anybody can sign up for a tech talk. Maybe it, they have a friend who's an external speaker they want to bring to Twitter to give it a conference talk. Maybe they're going to give a conference talk and they want to practice for an internal audience. Um, this happens all the time. It's a rare month that we don't have uh, a tech talk or two. And as we kind of go through these stories, we wanted to uh, talk about some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, and here, the first lesson for us in um, supporting a bunch of these peer learning experiences is that you do have to provide support. So we aren't just sort of saying, you know, hey, go ahead, feel free, make classes if you want to. Um, there's hands-on support, and that can be very uh, humble support, like, hey, I'll help you find a room. I'll help you with the AV problems. I'll help you uh, look at your desired audience and find the folks who should participate and help you market. Um, the goal is to lower friction so that engineers can participate in education, and that's just the default normal action uh, for engineers. And then the other kind of lesson learned is really the other side of the coin, which is, we don't want education to be something that comes from us and goes to them, right? We're, we're trying to cultivate peer learning and so frequently uh, provide the support and then get out of the way. Encourage people to take ownership. Say, this is your thing. Go ahead and schedule it. You don't need to ask for permission. Uh, you own it. And I just might, might mention that's, that's where the approach starts to scale. More engineers doesn't mean more people I have to teach. It means more people who could be, who could be running an educational engagement of some kind. So engineering flight school, this is what we call our onboarding program for engineers. Everything at Twitter is bird, all of our content. Birds, lots of bird puns. So we have flight school for new engineers. And as Simeon mentioned, the background at Twitter University, this started with an acquisition a few years ago on uh, the people that run this. And really the small scrappy band of like volunteers running what they call their orientation. And um, focused mostly on the culture and history of Twitter and why we do what we do, how we do it. And uh, we've since expanded to um, what we have now. So you mentioned also we have um, one week of in-person onboarding. So the first day they're doing our, um, like just getting them jazzed for the week and for working here. And then they have four days of more of the technical side of onboarding, which is um, flight school. And there's two days uh, really focused on uh, this broader, like broader technical and cultural classes, and then two days of more specific technical content. And everyone's in person globally for that. And then following that, there's this longer tail of one or two classes a week for a few weeks. And if they're not based in San Francisco, they can dial in for those. So we continue to after, but we just have them full time for that first week. And one thing that um, we've developed is this clear story or narrative. I think Jen spoke about that in her talk as well, developing this, this cohesive narrative that runs through all the classes. And so in ours, similar to what they do with Lyft was, um, although we don't do zoo animals, um, we, um, we say, okay, we're making this hypothetical feature at Twitter. This is what we're going to develop. And we weave that story into each of the classes. So even though the classes have different topics about this tool or this thing, this process, how does it apply to building this hypothetical feature that we've invented for the week that we're working on the week. Uh, we're still small and scrappy. We just have a couple full-time instructors and then a lot of volunteers. And uh, But we've grown from that original six or so working to more than 50 engineers that have taught a flight school class at Twitter. And we've learned some lessons along the way. Um, number one, always be recruiting. So we as I mentioned, have volunteer instructors, meaning uh, anything you do with volunteers, there's turnover. And so we have to continually be keeping this pipeline full. Um, sometimes people leave Twitter, sometimes they just get busy or they change roles or they're just like, I don't want to teach anymore right now, I need a break. Uh, so we always have to keep that pipeline going. And um, we focus on doing that in a couple ways. One is that we have a low barrier to entry. Uh, so rather than saying, okay, if you want to teach, kind of prove to us that you can. You have to sit through these trainings, you have to sign off on it, all of these things. Rather, start more from this point of, all right, you're interested, great, you can do this. And then maybe take them through, through a few steps depending on who they are. They could teach, the, they could practice teaching the class 
uh, to just two or three people and get feedback until they feel comfortable with the full room. Or they could co-teach it with somebody who has been teaching the class for a while. So approach it more from this. We have confidence in you perspective versus are you sure you can teach? Uh, and so we have that low barrier. And then we try to reward them and help them um, a few different ways. Sometimes it's tied to actual like recognition with their manager, um, which you know can impact things like promotion growth. And as well as uh, providing flag, everybody likes flag. So I'm always trying to give people. So one challenge that we have is uh, one size fits all. I feel like maybe you run into this at your own organization. So uh, we have all kinds of people coming in the door and they have all kinds of different experience. They're being hired for different roles. We've just lumped them into, well, you're an engineer. So you're going to sit through the same training. Uh, but that means that some of them are sitting through a lot of classes that are relevant to them, and some of them are sitting through a lot of classes that don't feel are applicable to their role. So that's something we've been looking at this year. That is still in progress of how do we make this efficiently scale to all these different types of people in different roles so that without teaching like 50 one-off classes to these two people or these two people, um, how do we still make people feel like it was personalized to them? Uh, without um, getting too granular. So that, that's the balance that we're working on trying to strike right now. So the, next, uh, the next story I want to tell you about um, is a machine learning class, a uh, series of classes that we did um, kind of starting in early 2017, a uh, request from the executive level ended up landing on my desk, which was put everybody in the company through, uh, you know, kind of a broad overview of what is machine learning, how to, how to sort of use it. And it was for both technical and non-technical folks. And, uh, honestly freaked me out a little bit because I'm not a machine learning expert. Um, so I, I went to our, our Cortex team, kind of the team that has uh, kind of dedicated to machine learning sorts of tasks and talked to the subject matter experts, the people that do this and said, hey, what should this class look like? What should people, what should people be learning? Um, what should we teach? And their initial class outline uh, was what I frequently get from engineers. Um, you know, here's a list of 10 algorithms. We should teach people, people should know all these different algorithms, how they work. Um, and after some pushing and shoving and negotiating, uh, with the subject matter experts, eventually I decided, decided let's, let's run a version of the class. We'll get some negative feedback um, and it'll, it'll strengthen my hand a little bit, trying to argue for ways to, to structure the class. Um, and I got that in spades. I had a, a VP from a ML acquisition lurk in the class and go directly from the class to Jack's desk, I believe, to say, don't let anybody take this class because it'll confuse the hell out of them. Um, so the story had a happy ending. Like it, it did uh, definitely strengthen my hand. We, we iterated, we eventually got this turned into uh, a very successful and in-demand course. And uh, we had long wait lists. We had a huge uh, in instructor teach the trainer program. We had offerings in every office um, and more or less everybody in the company, technical and non-technical got the opportunity to take an initial course and some follow-up courses uh, for more technical folks and kind of understand, you know, what is, what is machine learning? How does it apply to Twitter? Uh, and the course is still offered today to, to new hires and it makes me happy every time I co-teach it, which I do occasionally. Um, with my friends from Cortex, and students say things like, this is the best overview ML course I ever took, and it's better than the one I had at Google, and I just beam a little bit, you know, every time I hear that sort of thing. Um, well, the lessons learned uh, from that particular experience, uh, for me, like, how did we end up with a happy story starting from a, well, scary start, at least? Uh, my advice, the subject matter experts, was we, we gotta, it's gotta be a story. You know, th there's gotta be a narrative Narrative is what lets humans, you know, take a random collection of facts and sort of internalize them. And then it turned out that it wasn't just a story, but it needed to be a story about us. And by us, I mean about Twitter. Typical feedback from uh, tweeps, we call them, is make it more Twittery. And, and they want to be able to hear, like, how does this solve our problems? How will I use this? How, how have we used this technology in the past? Um, and that approach, telling the story of us, made the class useful even to folks who took it and were technical and already had some ML background and so they didn't need the refresher on the concepts, but the us part was really uh, important to them. The other learning from this experience um, for me was to embrace the role of facilitator. So I'm a software developer by background and I'm typically used to uh, teaching something that I have expertise in or I acquire the expertise. So didn't know Scala before I got to Twitter, but you know, I have to teach a few Scala courses. I practice my Scala programming. This ML field is, is large and vast and complicated, and it was not practical for me to say, I'll make myself an expert and then I can do this. Um, so partnering with subject matter experts who deeply understand the field and helping them to communicate in ways that will um, reach and motivate humans was a really rewarding experience for me. And finding technical people who can take pride in 
becoming skilled facilitators or helping other uh, experts create effective classes is the, the key to scaling the talent. Okay, so this is a hot topic uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, as it should be. Uh, I feel like probably all of us run into this at our company. Um, how can we increase diversity in our company? And I think we all also know that this goes beyond so much more than just, oh, we hired X number of, like, we need to think through, like, things like inclusion and visibility and how can we make this a good place to work for a variety of people. Uh, so one thing that I noticed when I got hired earlier this year is that a lot of the classes are being taught by men. And uh, there's lots of ways we could increase diversity in instructors, but that's typically the one that I focus on. So I got hired in Q1, and in Q2, I made a goal to, uh, I wanted to increase the number of women teaching. I wanted that visibility in front of the room, especially in onboarding. I wanted women who got hired at this company to see somebody that they could relate to. And, and uh, so I looked at the numbers, and Twitter's diversity data is, is publicly shared online. And so I, I knew from looking at that, that uh, the breakdown of men to women in engineering. And uh, I knew from some of our data that we weren't, we weren't even reflecting that. Like we had more men teaching than even that person. So I wanted to make it more on par with representing our actual course. Um, so we were able to do this to get more women teaching and make it more, uh, was able to meet that goal of making it reflect um, the overall workforce percentages. And the, the lesson learned is just to be intentional. Uh, there's ways to beat around the bush and be like, I want some new teachers, right? But if I just said, you know, too many men are teaching. <laughs> I want more women teaching. And sometimes I said that in a room of all men, which is always a funny little moment. Where you're like, it's too many men teaching, and you're all men. Um, but you have to just say it and be intentional, and people will buy into what you're saying and uh, reach out to people. And they may know people even if they're like, you know, even if all the people in the room are men, they might have a direct report that is, they think, oh, she could be great at refer me to. And uh, in terms of uh, not missing out, uh, just keep in mind that the people with something to share is greater than the people who think that they have something to share or know that they have something to share. Uh, so there's imposter syndrome at play, and that particularly impacts women. And they might be thinking, I'm not the biggest expert on this at the company. I'm not even the biggest expert on my team, or I can't teach a room of people. So really taking that opportunity, if I even saw like a glimmer of that person was mentioned to me or they seemed kind of interested, like put time in their calendar, say, great, we're getting coffee and we're going to talk through like, <laughs> why do you think you can't do this? And I'm going to convince you that you can do this. Uh, so really being intentional about that and remembering that um, peer learning at scale means it has to be for everyone. And part of that is um, increasing the diversity. If you're scaling, but only for one kind of, one particular part of your audience, it's not an effective. Uh, so story number five, uh, I wasn't sure what to call this. I, I ended up saying communication. Um, but the story is basically this. Moving uh, from an external company that was an outside vendor to lots of tech companies offering tech training and then moving to being acquired by Twitter, being an you know, internal organization, I honestly thought this would make a lot of my job easier. We don't have to market anymore. We have a captive audience. Like, where are they going to go? They got to take the classes we offer. Um, no. <laughs> so it turns out that marketing and communicating is still crucial for an educational organization. Um, especially in a, in a large and busy organization. Uh, so I just want to tell you about some of, the, some of the ways that we've advertised and who we're targeting, who I'm trying to when I communicate. Um, the who, well, potential instructors. So there are lots of people who should be teaching. Maybe it's a team that owns a product um, that lots of people use, and there's confusion about maybe it's somebody that has an area of expertise that they could be sharing and they're not currently. Um, I also need to reach potential attendees. There are classes going on all the time that people don't take that they could have taken and would have increased their satisfaction or given them key skills to perform their job. Um, so how do, we, how do we reach those people, people who should be participating in education in a variety of ways? Uh, well, you know, sadly, email, of course. Actually, it's weird that email is so successful. The single most successful thing that we do is every week mail out a breezy summary of, hey, here's stuff coming up to all of Eng, um, and watch the enrollment numbers climb. Uh, we do a bunch of other emails, and a lot of those are automated. So our learning management system, our Homeworld uh, LMS, does let people, for instance, subscribe to a course, something like Tech Talks. I want to know every time it happens. Just send me an email so I can sign up. Um, or students indicate their interest in a course that's not scheduled, and it automatically emails the instructors and lets them know, you have students if you would only uh, offer your course. Um, lots of email stuff along those lines. And then we've also tried a variety of other venues. Um, we, of course, have a wiki. We, of course, have a Jira space. We, of course, have a Slack channel. 
kind of the standard engineering comms channels, but we've invested some effort in electronic billboards. So some screens scattered around the office that uh, promote upcoming classes. And we can also use them to do things like show instructor leaderboards, people who have uh, taught a lot of classes with positive uh, ratings. We've even experimented with doing things like printed flyers going super low tech. Um, a recent hack week saw one of the tech docs engineers writing sticky notes, getting pre-printed sticky notes, I think, and leaving them on a bunch of engineers monitors. Think about the docs. Um, so we've done a bunch of different communication venues and we have learned some lessons along the way. And I guess the first primary one is just that marketing matters even for an internal organization or I don't know, especially for an internal organization, maybe even. But remember that you're marketing to engineers. So that TLDR is super valuable. Text is uh, preferable. The email flow at Twitter can feel like a fire hose. There's just there's a constant demand on your attention. And people appreciate when you respect that attention and you give them information as quickly as possible and kind of get out of their hair. Engineers also really appreciate the automation features, things that can make their lives easier uh, and that they can control and they can, they can choose how they're, uh, how they're used. That's really appreciated. Uh, an area of challenge, we we're talking about um, sharing our stories and sharing areas of challenge. An area of challenge for me is we have occasionally experienced the awesome comms power of executive support. Uh, so the jackhammer, when Jack says, everybody in the company should take this class, everybody does. Um, but education is rarely top of the mind for an engineering organization. It's one of those things that's never that urgent, doesn't feel like. So we've rarely enjoyed uh, the awesome power of the jackhammer or, or its equivalent. So this gets us uh, to the end where we have a little bit of advice. Um, those are our stories, and we just want to highlight some of the things that we noticed. Um, I, I wanted to highlight, especially for engineers who are kind of in this technical instructor role, you have uh, previously enjoyed having expertise in a thing and then learned you can share that expertise with others, go a little further and embrace that role of facilitator. You can teach people things that you're not an expert at yourself, or you can facilitate that education happening, which is just as valuable. And embrace the storyteller role. So helping other engineers figure out how to, how to make this a story, how to uh, capture and engage folks is really important. And I'll just repeat that, tell the story of us. Make classes with that at Twitter at the end are the ones that are successful for us. Uh, we've talked about recruiting volunteers to so just reiterate some of those points. Um, recruit a wide pool, always keep refreshing it. Uh, recruit everybody, um, look for all kinds of different people that may, maybe even the ones who are less vocal, but they, they're totally capable of teaching. Um, and then provide an easy on ramp so just lower that barrier to entry because people are short on time and sometimes low on confidence. And so that lower barrier to entry helps them. But really focus on cultivating owners. Uh, there's the difference between people who are willing to just teach occasionally and then not think about it the rest of the time and the people who are like, really like, like this, they want to get involved, really leveraging them. You get them to recruit other people to teach or they have an idea for a follow on class that they want to develop. That's really great. Like leverage that and help them feel like, hey, you're now running ML education at Twitter and there's something exciting to them about that. And so leveraging people that act like owners and like feeding that autonomy. The last piece of advice. Uh... The discussion about peer learning, uh, peer learning is not the only solution to uh, scaling educational efforts, but I, I really strongly believe it's a necessary part of uh, tackling those problems at scale. So build incentives that make education a normal part of an engineer's life. And whether that means making that part of the, the promo ladder, whether that means calling out the positive things that engineers do, uh, there's lots we could discuss about how to incentivize that, but you do need to incentivize uh, that being just a cultural norm for your organization. It, engineers teach other people, they share their knowledge, they communicate with the organization. Uh, and there's a bunch more that we could talk about, um, docs versus classes, how to measure impact. I'm very interested in a bunch of those things, but I'm gonna leave, uh, leave those for you to tell me about. So we shared some stories with you. I suspect we're not gonna do a ton of QA because the food smells good and it is noon. <laughs> One question, but I'm hoping to meet some of you and I, I'm happy to answer questions if you've got them, but I'm also looking forward to hearing your stories. Thanks for listening. Okay. We've got time for, unfortunately, only one question. However, we do have several networking <laughs> opportunities today uh, really to ask those questions. So. No. I think we have uh, one question all the way over here. Oh, I, I saw Bear with me as I walk. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. One thing that popped into my head is something I heard years ago. Someone told me, those who can, do and those who can't teach and those who can't teach administrate and so I think there's a sort of a strat of a hierarchy among different um, jobs where 
um, people either publicly or privately feel that the only thing that counts really is to be a hardcore software engineer. How often have you encountered that and how do you deal with it? Yeah, one quick thought that I have on that. Um, we talked about incentivizing and rec like recognition, and I think it's part of motivating people who are maybe like I'm a little bit interested, in, but like does my manager care if I can teach people around me? And so trying to develop things like this culture of learning, like if you teach with us, like you're part of a community, and also your manager knows that you teach, and that can play into your promotion. Even just something as simple as you get this cool sweatshirt, so you're like part like that identity feeling. I think matters to people. So like um, that that sense of like I belong to something and I'm contributing to something. Uh, so that was a concern of mine. Actually, switching from being a software engineer to a technical instructor. Like, am I going to not code and then forget how to do it in five years from now? Sort of you know be adrift. Uh, so one thing I think it's important to address that with your full time technical instruction staff. We have previously had a you know, kind of 25 percent time policy and I do software development for our own team and for other teams. I have occasionally um, during various emergencies joined another team for a quarter to work on something that needed to be, uh, you know, needed a little bit of extra manpower. Um, so making sure that the people who do the education stay current with their technical skills is important, but flip it around. Um, if I talk to a staff engineer, I am happy to say your job is not to sit in the cubicle and code. If you're not sharing your knowledge with the whole organization, you're not a, you're not a senior member of the organization. And I think in a mature organization, People recognize that, and you see uh, senior people who want to step up and uh, communicate, whether that's documentation, whether that's teaching, whether that's facilitation. Thank you both very, very much. Let's give them a give them a hand.